as anybody who's been following politics knows, there is a deep divide right now, right now among Republicans between those who support Donald Trump and what he has done to the GOP and those who detest Donald Trump but still maintain that they are centrist to, to right conservatives. Well, there's an effort by some Democrats to try to provide a new home for them. It's called the Welcome Party and the founders of the Welcome Party join us now. Lauren Harper and Liam Kerr are on the program. Lauren, first to you, explain what was the idea behind the Welcome Party and what do you envision? Right, well, we're not trying to create a third party. We're trying to make a big tent Democratic Party, right? So we started last year for the 2020 Democratic primary in the early states of New Hampshire and South Carolina, my home state, South Carolina. And we did um, GOTV for independent um, voters to participate in this Democratic primary. Um, we wanted to make sure that they realized that they could participate in this primary, first of all, and that they could have a voice in the Democratic Party in selecting our next presidential nominee. And so Liam, is it very focused specifically on people who are say registered Republicans or specifically might be moderate Republicans? So the focus is anyone who may not feel welcome in our party. Uh, and as Democrats, we wanna be the welcoming people um, in many different ways. And unfortunately, we know that's not how we're perceived by too many independents and too many potentially winnable Republicans who could come over. And we saw in the 2020 primary, you know, candidates like Joe Biden, um, and you know, Pete Buttigieg explicitly saying we need to create future former Republicans. Uh, and it was clear that there is energy there and we need to build stronger on ramps to bring them into the Democratic Party. I want to ask you both about some issues because there are a lot of progressives who sometimes feel are not so welcome in the, in the Democratic Party as well. Some key Democratic issues, do you support the people who you're going after support raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, Lauren? Well, we we support ideologies across the spectrum, right? Like we we just did an op-ed recently um, about Senator Joe Manchin and his stance on the Voting Rights Act, trying to make sure that people understand that whatever shade of blue you are, you should be able to find a home in the Democratic Party. So whether you are um, ideologically more left or more left of center, you should be able to find a home in the Democratic Party, run as a Democrat, vote Democrat, and feel embraced by the Democratic Party that is being put out right now. But Liam, shouldn't the Democratic Party stand for, regardless of whether you're a progressive or whether you're a Trump Republican, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour for all the reasons that Democrats have been putting forward for the last many years? Yeah, Republicans have been winning and winning beyond where they should be because of their stances on unpopular, unjust issues like the minimum wage. And they've been winning because they have been focused on playing by the rules of the current game and winning. And the litmus test game is advantage Republican. They know how to play that game. It's been interesting as we've been going out and reaching you know, across the proverbial aisle to try to keep that majority that can prevent a speaker Trump after 2022. We've been hearing from some Republicans who say you don't know how to win. And that's a frustration for them. And we need to win. Our democracy depends on it. People on minimum wage depend on it. Well, I agree with you that Democrats need to win, but there's an argument that the reason that Republicans have been winning is because they don't have integrity, because they lie, because they mislead people about whether it's the vaccine or they mislead people about the election results or about climate change. At a certain point though, Democrats don't, don't they need to protect integrity and honesty in what you're saying to voters, Lauren? Oh, absolutely. There, there's no refuting the fact that we're trying to not be a party of integrity. It's a matter of what's coming at, what's at stake, right? Like I said, I'm from South Carolina, and when we have a GOP-controlled state legislature and even our congressional seats, things happen in South Carolina that don't necessarily happen in other places that are safe blue states, right? You know, our state legislature just approved the firing squad to be a method of capital punishment in our state, and that probably would not have happened if we had more Democratic seats in the House and in the Senate. Those things are at stake for people in South Carolina and other red states where running as a Democrat, you're probably going to have to be more left of center versus far left to, to win. But to, in order to have those seats, in order to keep those seats, and even in Senator Joe Manchin's case, you have to have a spectrum, an ideological spectrum that is able to cater to the electorate that is from your state. Well, speaking of catering, give us a message, Lauren, specifically, whether it's somebody in South Carolina or another you know, red state that they are disillusioned with the GOP based on Trump, but maybe they like some conservative principles and maybe don't know much about progressive principles, but what is the message to try to attract them? You know, the message are, so my background's in local government. I used to work for Columbia Mayor Steve Benjamin. The message is really 
about the issues versus the partisan politics, right? I think what we saw last year was the fact that Republicans went on to the divisive rhetoric and it stuck. In South Carolina, you said defund the police, you said Nancy Pelosi, and it automatically got you Republican votes, right? So the messages in South Carolina are much more on the what is actually not dividing us and what is actually going to progress us forward as people. You know, people need healthcare, people need jobs, people need safe communities, right? So the messages that are actually going to cater to everyone, things that people all, all people care about when you make a list of things that people care about and they all agree on, those are the things that are going to pass and those are the things that are going to get people and candidates excited about, uh, voters excited about candidates. Liam, you guys mentioned this, uh, this op-ed about uh, Joe Manchin. Do you consider Joe Manchin to be a success, to be a model? Or is he someone who's essentially the antithesis of what Democrats stand for because of his efforts and also Christian cinemas to essentially gum up Democratic legislation and bottle it up? Yeah, Harry Anton at CNN answered that question. He is a miracle. Joe Manchin is not just a bonus for Democrats. He is an electoral miracle. Uh, you have proof in Joe Manchin that a third of West Virginia voters will split their vote, will vote for a Trump and then turn around and vote for a Joe Manchin. And you know, Democrats, your viewers, progressives, people who don't feel at home on the left, people who don't feel at home on the center or center right, they're usually people of science and we're the party of science. And that also means political science. And when you look at the political science, it's very clear. You need to reach out and bring people in, especially when you're the liberal party. It's just math. Only 25% of Americans identify as liberal. And so when we have a majority of the country, that means less than half our party will be liberal. And that might not be as fun as we'd like it to be, but it's the reality, it's science, and we gotta live in that world. Wait, Liam, what about the argument that one of the reasons Democrats are not doing better with centrists and not attracting more Republicans is because Democrats all too often are like the Republican establishment, beholden to Wall Street, protective of corporate interests, exactly like Joe Manchin, as opposed to the Democratic Party defining itself more towards raising the minimum wage, tackling climate change, eliminating student debt, reigning in Wall Street. Wouldn't that be a better differentiator for the Democrats to say, look, we're not the party of Wall Street, we're not the party of corporate greed and corporate power. Wouldn't that be a better model? Well, I mean, that's a great way to get a lot of retweets. Uh, but we found you know, winning on Twitter too often means losing at the ballot box. Um, you know, the, the Democratic nominee for mayor in New York put it well. Other candidates thought this was about social media and the people on there. This is about people on social security. And it's unfortunate uh, that you know, we can't do things the way that we like, the way that we you know, may deeply feel is the, the perfect way to go do things. But we have to live in this world, this reality world. And we have 30 seats where Trump got less than 57% of the vote. These are seats where Jared Golden would have won. A Jared Golden or Jason Kander level, level overperformance would have won. And Democrats did not field a candidate who ran a competitive election, who spent you know, even a million dollars, um, which is basically the floor to run a competitive election. So this question of are we fielding too many moderates in these places, there are dozens of seats where the Democratic Party is literally not running a competitive election. There's not too much reaching out, there's not enough. But how do you inspire people to participate in a midterm election that's in 2022? It's not a presidential. I mean, if you are more similar to Republicans than different from them. And you mentioned Social Security. I mean, Joe Manchin essentially stands in the way of expanding Social Security benefits. So there's some talk that maybe Joe Manchin and other centrist Democrats want to raise the retirement age, which seems like it's an anathema to what the Democratic Party stands for. How do you inspire people who do care so much about Social Security when you say, "Oh, be like Joe Manchin, be like these centrist Democrats? Lauren. You know, we, we have to look at what's important and what's at stake for people in particular states, right? When we go back to the ballot box, you're not just voting to vote for someone who's gonna represent your district in the US Congress. You're voting, you're voting for someone who's gonna represent you in your neighborhood, right? In your city, in your county, in your state, right? So you're going after someone who is going to represent the interests that best align with where you stand ideologically and also what issues matter to you and the people around you, right? So when we can go based on what that is, I think that'll be better suited for people who are voting. And Liam, what are you hearing from the Democratic establishment about your efforts? I assume that they are supportive and helpful. How does this differ from DNC efforts to reach to centrist and independent voters? Yeah, so we're an entrepreneurial effort. Um, you know, we 
launched uh, as a group of individuals, and we continue to be a group of individuals uh, who are individual Democrats who feel deeply that we need to reach out. And this is not a top down strategy. Uh, I haven't been to DC in over a year and a half. Uh, you know, we live in, in two different states and we have supporters uh, and colleagues around the country. Uh, it's not a top down effort. This is gonna have to be peer to peer reaching out, going to people and saying, you are welcome in our party. Uh, and together we can preserve our democracy and maybe not make things perfect, but we'll make some progress. And Lauren, how do you measure success? You measure success by winning. So those 30 seats, if it doesn't work, somebody could say, look, you know, it was a noble effort by the welcome party, but they came up short. If it does work and the welcome party helps move some of these seats in the Democratic column, that would be success, right? Right, absolutely. You're, we're making progress and trying to change people's thoughts, patterns of beliefs and systems of beliefs. Lauren Harper and Liam Kerr, they are co-founders of the Welcome Party. It's an interesting effort and I, and I wish you the best of luck. We will certainly be following this and thanks for joining us on the conversation, we appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, we really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more, there's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun, but you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.